the funny thing about conditioning humans is that you really have to take into account the human condition. This is my conversation with Sabrina Victoria. What if the truth came in a gel cap and we could just pop it in our mouths and forget about it? Well, it doesn't, and we can't. But we can laugh in the face of reality while plotting our survival. Welcome to the Truth Tastes Funny podcast. I am your host, Hirsch Repun. And if my guests can handle the truth, so can you. Open wide, folks. Here it comes. My guest today is Sabrina Victoria. Sabrina is the creator and CEO of Human Better 365. It's a human transformation company. She transforms humans into happier humans, better humans. And she knows from what she speaks because she's been through a lot. And like we just talked about before the show, we've all been through a lot. The operative thing is what do we do with it? How do we handle it? And just watching some of Sabrina's posts on social media made my day yesterday. So she's here to, no pressure, but to make our day. And welcome, Sabrina, to Truth Tastes Funny. Thank you for having me. So appreciate it. So funny when you were talking about transform humans, you kind of paused for a half a second and I thought you were going to be funny. My brain immediately went to aliens because for the past two days, I've just been submerged because of this whole Joe Biden thing with aliens. I've never thought about aliens or talked about aliens or thought nothing, but I'm like, let me just look up some alien shit. I don't even know. So I've got all of this alien conspiracy theory in my head right now. So right away, that's where my brain went. It was so funny. So you went right to the extraterrestrial <laughs> transformations. This By is how way, our minds work. That isn't a bad, you know, thinking ahead, maybe a year or so in the future, it might, the introduction might go like that. You know, yeah. Sabrina works with humans. She works with extraterrestrials. <laughs> she now yeah. believes what she used to call, quote, what you called in Vanity Fair magazine in 2017, that bullshit <laughs> now becomes, well, it would be nice if Joe Biden were an alien because that yeah. would put that whole age thing to rest. There he would you say, go. you know what? I'm actually not 80. I'm actually 8,000 years old. There you go. And so by my standards, where I come from, I'm kind of a baby. So, <laughs> right around, you know, right around middle age. Yeah, and we usually lose the stutter around 4,000 years old. Oh, my God. That's where the stutter goes away. So we can start this conversation wherever you like. If you want to start it, you know, at this moment in time and share a little about what you do and then backtrack, you can do that. You can start it in 1946, right after World War II. I don't know what that would have to do with anything, but it, you could if you wanted I to. Could. I could. This episode is our version of Star Trek. We can go wherever we want. I love it. We can go wherever we want. And we can wear costumes, too, if we want. I do love to tell a little bit about my backstory, just because it really puts into context where I am and, you know, why I view life the way I view. So I was actually raised as a Jehovah's Witness. So I've been in sales my whole life, I like to say. I was door knocking and hawking religion at the age of five. And everything was pretty good until I became boy crazy right around the age of 16. And then all hell broke loose for myself and my family. Right around 20, I ended up pregnant with no husband, emphasis on the no husband part. And because of that, I was completely what's called disfellowshipped or disassociated from my entire family and my entire community and basically everything that I had ever known. And I was basically just kind of thrown out totally naive to the world, totally, absolutely no adulting skills whatsoever, and led the stereotypical single mom life of broke. I had a running balance of negative $172 in my bank account at any given time. I had to choose between driving to the grocery store or buying food because I couldn't do both. And car getting repoed out of the parking lot, eviction notices on my apartment door every other month, just total helplessness total despair, suicidal thoughts, dealing with postpartum, and just wanting to run away from life. Soon after that, I ended up in a very toxic relationship. Let's just put it lightly. It was 13 years of a nightmare, basically. I was uh, shown this bright, shiny object of money, which is well, the one thing that I was missing in my life. So I thought at that point, 
and I was showed this dream of building an empire and living with somebody and everything being taken care of. And what it wound up being was, you know, get rid of your place, live with me, get rid of your car, use my car, get rid of your phone, use my phone, get rid of your job, work for me. Uh -huh. Within a very short amount of time, he basically controlled, not basically, he did control every part of my life and emotional abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse, doubled, tripled, quadrupled over the course of time. And eight years in, I'm on the floor in the bathroom having a total breakdown, just like, I don't know if you have ever had this happen to you or any of your listeners, but just like everything in your body, just feeling as if it is coming out through your tears and screams and cries. And I'm on the floor and just like a prisoner, literally like a prisoner. And I took out my phone and I like to say, Google saved my life. I Googled, why is my boyfriend bullying me? Because I didn't know any other vernacular other than the word bully. Mm -hmm. And the entire world of abuse just hit me right in the face, everything except for physical abuse. And I recognized that I had no voice, no power, no money. And I was extremely codependent had very high empathetic vibes, had no boundaries, and I dove head first into personal development. I researched everything I could find my hands on. I opened up a secret bank account, a secret storage unit, and over the course of four years, I was able to start three online businesses secretly, collect $50,000, which doesn't seem like a lot of money, but to me, it was literally like I was a millionaire, and escaped. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And I knew some of that from, you know, just background and looking you up and stuff. But wow, just to hear that is like, I can totally picture it. And while I obviously don't have the same exact life experience, I know those moments where there just isn't any answer in that moment because this is past having looked for the answer. Now yeah. it's like, oh my God, what is happening? What is going, but you did. So, and I know there's more to it and I know more stuff happens that is kind of crazy and unbelievable. Have you seen this film with Aubrey Plaza called Emily the Criminal? It's no. a new, it's, it's, or I mean, she might've made it a, a few years ago now, but it's out now. Uh, and it's, I think it's on HBO Max, I'm not sure. But she is just, amazing in it. And I'm mentioning it in the context of this conversation, because I think people who are interested in this conversation and who have relate in some way to what you went through and what, you know, what your path was, will get where this is coming from. And you should definitely watch it. But you may, you empowered yourself to now, one thing that I'm curious about is what was, you know, the whole concept of family kind of cutting you off, you know, I know what that, you know, that, that happens in a lot of communities, you know, sadly that families will excommunicate their, their children, you know, which is just crazy to me, you know, with the one thing I've always tried to make my kids understand is that that's not, that isn't possible. It isn't possible for me to stop loving them or stop communicating with them or stop caring for them. It's just not possible. But that said, it's like, so what was your awareness of the world? Like, what was your exposure to the world at large? Clearly, it was somehow limited by your upbringing, right? So yeah. maybe just backtrack a little bit to that moment where you get cut off. Yeah totally scary. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses just in general are brought up or raised to be extremely naive. The answer to every single question that you could possibly have within that association or within that religion is bring it to God and God has all the answers. And that was, I think, was one of the mis biggest missteps with my story that was so heartbreaking for me was there was a point, you know, when I first left, my son's father was in the picture. So he actually came and got me from my parents' house. My parents were like, get out of the house. You're a, 
a disgrace and a whole bunch of other things that they said that I will not say, repeat. My son's father came and got me, whisked me away in a car. We drove across state borders and we ended up in a place. And we started going to the Jehovah's Witnesses, to what they call the Kingdom Hall. And within a very short amount of time, maybe two or three months, they sit down and they have like the elders or the governing body or the, the people that run the place basically sit down with people who are sinners or who have been disfellowshipped. And they say like, hey, you're doing a good job. Or hey, you need to work on this. Or hey, we're noticing this or we're noticing that. So they sat down with me and they're like, hey, Sabrina, good job. Good job with highlighting all of your material and showing up at every meeting, even though you have no money for gas, spending a ton of money coming back and forth to church. So you can't buy food for your child or for yourself, but good job on that. However, one thing, we can't have you playing house with your son's father. You need to either marry your son's father or break up with your son's father. You can't be doing this whole back and forth thing. So me just so desperate for my family back, my community back, my relationship back with God and just feeling like such a horrible, gross sinner thought that me praying, right? Praying every single night on what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? Being told by God that I needed to break up with my son's father and being totally out of my mind, naive in like, hello, money. Mm -hmm. And broke up with him and he left the situation. It took about a week or two for him to finally leave because he just thought I was insane. And we were both broke. I mean, we were both broke. So how is he supposed to like help me financially and then also live his life separately? What I was expecting from God was everything. Silly. It was so really? silly. So he left and he just skipped town and never paid me a dime, literally never paid me a dime. And I'm sitting in my apartment with a baby working minimum wage job, trying to do all of the things on the floor, praying to God, because that's the only answer is God. There's no other resources, nothing else that could possibly be done, just God. And God never came. Hmm. He never came. He never answered. It's so disheartening yeah. and so naive. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also hard to, you know, the, the whole, the whole, a lot of, you know, religions have this built into it for some reason. And I draw a very distinct line between my perception of God and religion, a religion, because even if you believe all of the theology about the history of the, you know, a, a faith, that doesn't account for what humans do with it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So anything that comes out of a human's mouth isn't really the word of God, you know, somebody's interpretation and they're doing it. They're, they're spinning it. I've been in PR. I know what spin is, you know, and so I know what a, what spinning is. I know what a bullshit artist is. And I know what a snake oil salesman is. I know what all those things are. Yeah. So those are human things. Yep. That's not a, what a God does. Yep. And so the idea that, you know, God has all the answers is what somebody is telling us, not what God is showing us. Yeah. And God does a good job, in my view, of showing us stuff. Yeah. If God wants to show us stuff, we'll see it. Yeah. So, you know, so there you are left feeling like, you know, you're waiting for this to help. Yeah. So now you're the your child's husband and father's out of the picture. Yep. Then what happened well, to the next? Freaking just chaos for yeah. months, if not years, within probably a year and a half or so. So my son's father left probably around three months when my son was three months old. And then within a year and a half or so, I met this man, a knight on a shiny, you know, uh, yeah. knight on, a, on a horse who I thought was given to me by God. Yeah, yeah. Like I actually course, was like, yeah. finally, my prayers. And it wound up being the devil. Like, mm -hmm. for real. Absolute nightmare. An absolute nightmare. So now we can jump back to, you know, you plan your escape. And you do escape. And, and what does that look like? You had saved $50,000. You had a storage unit 
right? Yeah. And your son. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, and how old was your son at this point? He's a teenager? He's 11. At, at that time. Somewhere around there. pre Okay. Okay. Yeah. My idea was I had to get him out before like teens because I right. knew yeah. that would be horrible <laughs> atmosphere for my son to be in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so you have the means now to, and where, whereabouts is this? Like, where is this in the Where are we living? World? We're in Florida, yeah. South Florida. Of course. Yeah. That's where I grew up, Florida. But Florida, as you know, is like a... Florida is a, a many, many different nations in one, yeah. in one place. It could be, it, it can be any number of scenarios. They don't yeah. have a lot of change in the topography there, but there's just a lot of weird things that can happen in Florida. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah. So, okay. So what was your move at that point? Well, my money story, and I love to kind of give a little bit of a hint to the money story because, or a little bit of a backstory to it, because so many individuals who are in a situation like this, it's very scary. It's very fearful, especially if you're leaving on your own. You know, baby daddy is not in the picture. This is all I'm hanging on to. My relationship with my parents is all array. And you're feeling very alone. You're feeling super isolated. So when I first started on this journey of collecting money, uh, I did, you know, anything and everything. And my first thing was like a little eBay account. I just started selling stuff on eBay, all my son's toys and clothes and stuff like that and started collecting money. But, and then it kind of expanded from there. But the part that I like to talk about is it didn't just like one day I opened up a secret bank account and then just like four years later, 50 grand, yay. It didn't go like that. Yeah. So when I hit the 6,000 mark, I got, I started to get a little bit of an ego. And I was like, holy crap, like, look at me. I'm like doing stuff. I'm making stuff happen. I couldn't believe because I was been told every single day from point one to point from A to B that I was dumb and stupid and no college education and I would never make it. And how dare you, not a good mother, no business sense, no college degree. You're never going to make any money. I am your savior. Like, this is what I've been told. So I just think that I'm like useless, basically. Yeah. So one day I open up my little secret bank account. I have six grand in it. My fiance at the time, we wound up getting engaged, comes up the stairs and he, I left my bank account open on my computer for like one second too long. Yeah. And he saw the money and he literally flipped, flipped the fuck out. And my little $200 a week allowance that he would give me for groceries, gas, whatever, he, he stopped paying me that weekly right. amount. So that $6,000 got washed out immediately while I'm still working. He didn't pay me anything, nothing at all for all the work I was doing. I was working 14, 15 hours a day at his company, doing a whole bunch of shit for him for yeah. free. I was living, obviously he was paying my rent. So I shouldn't say for free, but you understand. Yeah. Then he started paying me again, six months later, I'm still working my business. I hit $13,000 about a year and a half later. I call up my son's father and I'm like, hey, listen, I'm leaving, I'm out. I just want to let you know, I'm super scared. I don't know what to expect. He's like, yeah, sure, I got your back, no problem. I'll watch my, your, you know, our son. Whenever you need me to, I'm there for you. Yes, I will help. So I'm like, cool. My son's father calls me up about three weeks later or something right before school starts. And he's like, Hey, I would love to take our son on a camping trip. And I was like, cool. That'd be great. A hundred percent. I'm looking for apartments right now. I've got like a ton of stuff going on. That would be fantastic. If you took him on a camping trip, long story short, he never returned him from the camping trip. He freaking stole oh, wow. him. Yeah. He just took him. <laughs> so yeah. I had to get a lawyer involved. We had emergency court orders. He was fighting for full custody. Didn't tell me where he was living like moved in with his girlfriend all this stuff all behind my back. And that $13,000 that I had saved went to zero with $18,000 in court fees. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So then I had to like, I'm sitting in my car two and a half years into planning my escape from this crazy individual that I'm living with. And I'm like, the universe hates me. God hates me. Like, 
What is going on? I'm doing all the things. I'm showing up. I'm being positive. I have an optimistic attitude. I'm being a great mother. I'm being healthy. I'm working my ass off. I'm doing all of the things that all of the books, Tony Robbins tells me to show up at 100% all the time and all the things. I am literally doing all of the things and I keep getting shit on. Yeah. So there's a point where I'm like, I guess this is my life. Like, This is it. I just have to put my hands up and I have to just say, you know what? This is my life. A lot of women live with abuse in abusive relationships. He's not hitting me, right? He's Mm -hmm. not like punching me in the face or anything. It's just like, it's just mental and emotional and verbal and sexual abuse all the time, every day. But like stuff that I could just zone out. I can zone out during sex. I can like leave my body during sex. You know, it's not. So I had to have this hard conversation with myself in the car. I have this document for child support or child custody that's like 18 pages long that cost me 18 grand, $1,000 per page. And I'm banging on my car. I'm crying my eyes out. I have no money again. And I had to make a decision. Am I going to do this again, lead this double life, continue to work my ass off three hours of sleep. Cause I'm working like three different jobs at this point. Or am I just going to like fall into my life? Just like mm-hmm. give everything up and just, this is my life and be done with it. Watch Ricky Lake reruns of Ricky Lake for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. I made a decision that I would continue to work and continue to build to leave this relationship until the day I died. Because I never, ever, ever wanted there to be a what if. I Mm -hmm. never wanted to think back to myself 20 years later when I'm 50 years old thinking to myself, the nightmare that I am living in and think to myself, what if I would have done it one more time? What if I would have done it two more times? What if I just would have kept going? What if I just would have contacted my best friend or my mom or another church, a Catholic church who helped people? Like I have to do it again. And I did. So at that point I was getting child support and plus my weekly play, plus my three businesses were rolling. I became an expert in all of the areas. And within one year, I was able to collect $31,000. Yeah. And with that $31,000 is how I wound up leaving that situation. And I think that it's so important to know that back end of that story because people fail one time and they're like, ugh. Or two times and they're like, oh, and this is with everything. This isn't just with relationships or abusive relate. This is with all the things that we have going on with our life. Weight loss, smoking, drugs, alcohol, you know, divorce, never falling in love again, business opportunities where we try once or twice and then that's it. Yeah. Well, you're a big proponent of, uh, you know, what's the big deal? You know, what if it happens? What if you fail? You know. Nothing. You know, what are, yeah, what are, what's going to happen? Now, that doesn't mean there aren't stakes. It just means that it's almost like we're in fear of fear. We're like, we're so scared. We're paralyzed by the what if of fear that we make the, the fear become much bigger. I remember when, when I was a little kid and my parents didn't really spank me, but my dad would threaten me or scare me into like, I would think he was going to spank me and his voice was so booming and he was like walking through the house to get me that the fear of whatever was going to happen just scared the shit out of me so that I would be sorry for what I did (laughs) without ever having a, a, a beating, you know? And so, and it's, of course, it's a game, like in a way, if you just said, oh, well, what are you going to do? Here I am, you know, but I wasn't that kid. I was like, oh my God, because my imagination would take care of the, of the rest. Yeah. And so we're so afraid of, of, you know, what if we fail? But, um, but you have to, you're right. You have to fail. If you didn't have that one, if you didn't have these mistakes that you went through and these incidents that happened, you wouldn't have learned anything you know, from them. So if you would have gotten a luckier break, let's say you might've lost bigger in another, in another circumstance, what was going on. So at the end of this legal 
travail? Did you get custody of your son? What, how did yeah. that? Everything play stayed out? the same. He just then had to pay child support. Yeah. So, you know, he had him every, my son's now 19 years old, but yeah. you know, he had him every other weekend and had to then pay child support. She hadn't paid any child support up to that point. So he actually kind of screwed himself. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, and that was like, you know, when I moved into my new place, it was a mattress on the floor. I literally left with my son, our clothes and my bicycle. That's it. Yeah. We had a booming business. We were bringing in millions. We had five houses paid in full, 12 cars paid in full, zero debt. Like I helped wow. him build that business. And I left with nothing except for my bicycle, basically. And must have been a nice bicycle. It was. It was a very, <laughs> I still have it. Yes. Yeah. It was a, a very nice bicycle, 100%. But yeah, I mean, it was the best feeling ever to step into mine, to step into my power, my money, my confidence, my voice, and finally have ownership over my future. Yeah. And what did you want to do at that point? What was your, obviously, you're always kind of on the edge of survival. So the goal is often survival, but were you thinking bigger than surviving? Yeah. I mean, still am. If you ask me now. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I do. I'm a huge visionary. The only reason, and I hate saying this, actually, I don't hate saying this. I love saying this, but you know, when I met my ex abuser, he was working out of his little tiny townhouse in the loft part, didn't have an office. By the time I, and he was 35 years old. By the time I left him 15 years later, we were running six different offices in four different states and had the world at our fingertips as far as money goes. And that was my vision. So my, I'm like, I'm always bigger and bigger and bigger. Just where are you now? How can we take a step up and where can, and I think that that's just in me. I think just naturally, I'm just naturally a visionary. So yeah, when I left, Dude, I mean, I've never worked for anybody else. I've I've worked for myself ever since. I'm always evolving, always creating, always bigger, more brilliant, brighter. Who else? Networking, collaborating. It's just built in me. Well, that's a fascinating thing because what it shows us is that your family didn't give themselves the opportunity to see that, mm -hmm. to see who you were. Mm. You know, mm. they didn't, they, it was not of any interest to them to discover that. Did you ever reconnect with them? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I got, I wound up getting reinstated when I was, it's all make believe. Oh, so thank like, God. I, I was going to say, oh, thank God you've been reinstated. I'm, yeah. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah. But reinstated when my son was maybe four. Yeah. Some around there. So yeah, everything went back to normal as if nothing had ever happened. There's never been an apology, never a conversation. It just is what it is. And then Jehovah's Witnesses have what's called fading. So you start going, you do all the things, and then you slowly just kind of fade out. And I had moved so many times that my car fade out of fade out of what? The religion. So you just kind of stop. You know, you go, but then you don't go, and then you go, and then you And that's like, an actual process that they have? Yeah, it's called fading. Fading. Well, they don't, that's not them. That's the people it's who not, are already out. It's that's not like their choice. Uh, yeah, that's our, like the people, the ex Jehovah's Witnesses have their right. own verbiage for that, and that's called fading. And then there's also called Pimo and, and Pomo, which is physically in, mentally out. So some people are still in, physically in, but they're actually mentally out. They're just going because they don't want to be excommunicated. Right. And then there's Pomo, which is what I am, which is physically out and mentally out. So yeah. I'm like 100% not interested. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And, yeah. But see, this is what I'm talking about when I talk about the the organizational aspect of a religion when it becomes a system yep. that is manned, and I don't even use that word incidentally, you know, that is manned by people, then, you know, it's like we hear about Scientology, but they, but all religions have it. It's yeah. any religion that involves people has, is flawed. It mm -hmm. has this problem, you know, 
And I'm not a theologist, but I did grow up in, you know, the Jewish faith, and I was very, you know, I was very well educated in that thing. I went to yeshiva all through my upbringing, and you know, and through college. I'm, I, you know, I'm surprised I'm not smarter. But I definitely, you know, learned a lot of stuff, and I, and you know, I see both sides of a lot of different things. I really try to, because if we only see our side. You know, we're only seeing half of what's out there. But in this case, for example, you had to see what the other half was yeah. in order to survive and to thrive. Yeah. What are the business? So, but now the the business or a business is helping people mm -hmm. who are going through an inability to 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 realize their potential. How would you describe it? So the company Human Better 365, I the foundation of it is time management and organization. I believe that all the issues with humans always boils down to a lack of managing time, a lack of or procrastination, a lack of organization, really anything that you could think of, even just like divorce or relationships. Or if you really boil it down, it's just not taking the time to do the thing to fix yeah. the thing. I mean, it all boils down to just where are you focusing? Where's your attention? Where's the time to fix the thing? So yes, helping 100%. And then it all goes back to power, confidence, voice, stages, sales, and really helping people recognize, you know, their power, their power in themselves, their power in their companies, their power in their businesses, in their careers and allowing people to step into who they are as a person, set boundaries, create a power around them, have the money that's necessary and sell themselves, you know, sell themselves as a human. I think that there's not enough emphasis on human, you know, like we're freaking humans. I mean, what the hell? Like out of all the things that you could possibly have come into this world to be, you are a human. <laughs> and I just don't think there's enough emphasis on like how to human. You know, we're taught all the things. We're taught math and spelling and science. And if you don't use the right apostrophe with the right thing, you're like shamed. It's like, dude, do you know how to be a human? This is where I should be like, do you know how to communicate? Do you know how to be in a relationship? Do you know what a toxic relationship looks like? Do you know how to do your finances? Do you know mindset? I mean, there's so many different arenas on just how to be me that are, should take precedent over you know, yeah. whatever else. I mean, if penguins can learn how to warm and protect an egg over the gestation period, then why can't humans figure out how to, you know, use a coffee maker? Yeah. It's like we could, we could figure out, we, you're right, we're blessed to be a come in as people. We may not be uh, people next time. When yeah. we come back next time around, we might be, you know, there's, there's a line, there's a, there's a song called Highwayman that is by the group, The Highwaymen, which was a super group with Johnny Cash and Chris Christopherson and Waylon Jennings and Willa Nelson. Why I know that, this, there's that much room left in there and this is what my brain decided to keep in there. But there's a song about that and it's, it's that they kind of lived through time in these various lives. And Johnny Cash's line is something like, um, I may come back as this, I may come back of that. He says, or I may come back as a single drop of rain. I will still remain. And it's just like gives me a little bit of chills yes. because the idea of what can be contained in a single drop of rain is very yeah. powerful. And wow. it's and it's like, so you're right. This potential is so amazing. We have all this potential to do things and to see things, you know, and then there are a lot of people out there who can coach. And I don't know if like I, what do you think separates what makes the right relationship between you and a client, let's say, or oh, the, the, you and the kind of person you can guide? The willingness to take coaching. I mean, the biggest issue that any coach has is linking up with an individual who's not open to doing things differently than the way that they've been doing it. I mean, it's yeah. so uncomfortable for people. I can't even tell you how many times I've, I have done initial interviews with people and I literally have to be like super uncomfortable, but like, I probably can't do anything for you. 
because they're not willing to take any suggestions. Everything is already did that, already tried that, already, no, absolutely not. I don't feel comfortable. It's like, dude, if you're not willing to do one thing different than what yeah. you were doing before, I mean, there's absolutely no way that you can move forward. You know, when I was leaving or any situation that I've ever been in, any challenge I've ever been in, it always goes from, I can't, absolutely impossible to, how can I? I mean, there has to be a question of how can I do it? Because right. if it's always like, I can't, impossible, there's no way, and you never even take a moment to think, well, what if, or how could I, or if I could, right. what would it look like? Or if there was an answer, what would the answer probably <laughs> be, be? Like, yeah. then there's absolutely no hope for you. You know, like I could have been in my situation when I was in my situation, real life, he would check my receipts for times and dates to make sure that I said that I was where I said I was like, I would have to come home with receipts and he would check the times, not the wow. days, the times to make sure that they lined up. He would check phone records. He would check computer history. He, so when you want to talk about being in a prison and absolutely no way out, I could have very easily have been like, there's no way. Yeah. Like there's nothing possible that I, he had cameras in and out of work and his home. So like, how do you possibly, that is a prison, that is impossible. Yeah. But I had to sit in a mindset of, okay, where do I have some time? Where do I have a section of maneuvering or availability yeah, yeah. to me that's mine? And I had to like figure that out in order to get to where I am. But very easily, I could have said, impossible. Impossible. And if you pay attention to stories of survival and stories of escape from any number of situations, it always comes down to that, that thing where you decide you're going to take a moment and think and not panic. You know, yeah. thinking and not panicking. You know, and someone who constantly shoots down your ideas, you, would, you might say to that, clients, you would say, okay, at this point, the only thing we can do is open a company that called Excuses Unlimited. And you can run that company. No, that's not possible. It's not possible. Okay. So since this is our last session, you get your deposit back. And that's the good news. I didn't give you a deposit. Oh, well, that's the bad news. Oh, right. You couldn't give me a deposit. I remember that. I remember that now. And what did I say? What did I say? You said, we'll find a way. And did we find a way? No. Because <laughs> cause you're firing me as a client. Yeah. yeah. I think that the ability, though, to laugh, like I said in the beginning of the interview, is like, for me, that has to be there yeah. in order to get through anything. Like, I've had those difficult conversations with people who didn't find humor. It doesn't even matter if I'm on the, you know shitty end of the stick you know it doesn't matter yeah. if the person has a sense of humor not obviously being a wit like an evil sense of humor you know has the humanity to have a sense of humor then that makes everything go so much easier 100. and so looking ahead now um what are some of your uh ideas what are some what are some of your uh, things that you have in motion are we going big here? Are we able to be a well, visionary in this conversation? Yes, of course. Of course <laughs> we can. So my 12 year plan, which, you know, is going to go real fast. Yeah. Well, it's going to go, it's going to take 12 years if it's a 12 year yeah. plan. It doesn't have to take 12 years, but. Okay. So I want to, so this human better 365 concept that I have, I've interviewed over 400 women up to this point, coaches, mentors, teachers, and quite a few men, but way more women. And my idea is to, my vision is to bring these women in virtually and or physically and actually create a human better school. So HB 365, I want to buy middle schools, So old used middle schools that are for sale, 
purchase them, blow them out, revamp them into huge workshops, event centers, and huge auditoriums where we can have speakers. I want to make like a TEDx combined with Mind Valley, where you mm -hmm. can do it virtually or you can do it physically and you can actually come to a location like a church-like atmosphere and you can see a speaker and you can learn something new that's not attached to any sort of biblical terms, but just like on how to be a better human, on how to just do it better than the way that you've been doing it before. Bring in speakers and coaches that have niches where that they are professional in or that they are educated in and then allow them to have a stage and then allow them to have a place where they can host a workshop or host an actual event for a weekend or a week or a month or whatever it is where people can then pay and they can attend these arenas or these areas of which that they are failing in, whether it's their health or whether it's their relationships or their family or their friends or whatever it is to help them level up, to help them level yeah. up as a human. So it's on, it's on track, you know, I'm gaining the people I'm doing the virtual right now and in hopes of soon attaining enough financial backing to attain actual physical locations to bring people together in community. That was the one thing that I was missing was community. And that's really the catalyst to everything that I'm doing is when I needed people, when I needed community the most, everyone left. Mm -hmm. And I just think that that's total bullshit. You know, when you decide as a human to do something a little bit differently than the way that the people around you are deciding to do it, it doesn't mean that you should have to lose your entire community. You should be allowed a place to be despite, you know, the inner workings of what your belief system is on God, atheist, agnostic, anything at all, aliens. You should still have the opportunity to be around humans and learn how to do this thing better than the way that you're doing it. Yeah. Previously. That's huge. That's beautiful. And the, and the fact is that, well, see, I think God would love that, <laughs> right? Yes, you thank know? you. <laughs> because that is that encompasses all of these good things we're supposed to be doing for one another. Yeah. Instead of, you know, standing on a street corner, judging somebody down the block, you know, and blocking their way, walking away and turning our back on them because they didn't do what we wanted. This this idea of what community really is supposed to be. And, and people do thankfully in a lot of cases find their people or their communities but this idea is wonderful which is that there's a way to, there's a way to human better we can human better cuz it 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 takes some of the pressure off of specific issues you know we have all these issues we face climate and all that, everything else but you know just the idea of we're human we're given this gift we're given all of these skills. Let's learn how to use them better. Yeah. Unless you're convinced that you're using them the best way you can, which some people are, but a lot of us are not. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, that's great. And is there anything you'd like to, I'll let you have the last word if you want to leave our audience with any kind of, uh, you know, we like to go positronic here, as you can tell. We like to give people some kind of little thought at the end of the show that they can build on you've given them a lot to think about already but anything floor is yours sabrina anything you want to share so the mantra that i have had with me since i was probably 26 ish 27 ish is everything's going to be okay there was times in my life minus the relationship minus the single mom minus the brokenness we are all, we're all dealing with stuff, right? Like even if you don't relate to my exact story, there's stuff that people are dealing with and we can get caught up in this mindset of worry and in this mindset of pessim pessim being pessimistic and not feeling like we have anywhere to turn and feeling hopeless and helpless. And just taking a moment, just taking a moment of silence and reassuring yourself, reassuring your inner child, that everything is going to be okay, that you have been through stuff, that you can do more stuff. And in the end, you'll be here. In the end, everything will work out. 
It'll take you on a different path. It might pivot you. However, in the end, you can turn around and you can smile and you can recognize that everything's going to be okay. And I think that if we do that enough, if we reassure each other ourselves enough that like I've done hard things before, I can do hard things again, everything is going to be okay. And we can continue to repeat this mantra in our heads. I think that life gets a little lighter. Thanks so much for tuning into Truth Tastes Funny. If you enjoyed the experience, please leave a five-star review and share this podcast with your friends.